Well, today we continue our series on the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, as you can already see, we're looking at patience. Um, patience. And uh, uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, somebody made a comment on a Facebook post I made about patience this, this week. And they said, I need it too. I'm like, don't we all? Don't we all? But um, I have been challenging to you to learn the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, so we're going to, again, we're going to read uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 together. Let's, let's say this together. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. I don't hear you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. James, can you blank the screen for a second? Go back to the first slide. All right. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I can't, I got it. All right, awesome. We want to look today at the fruit of patience. And then we are going to discover, as we have discovered with the other fruit of the Spirit, that there's a whole lot more to patience than we think there is to patience. Um, this was... This was, this was kind of an eye-opening study. And normally, normally when I do a series, I've, got, I've kind of had it all mapped out, and I know exactly where I'm going. And uh, This one has kind of already, as, we, as I told you about peace last week, and now as we look at patience, um, just, it's really incredible. And what, one of the things that I've really discovered on this journey of looking at the fruit of the Spirit is that Really, the fruit of the Spirit are all about what's called holiness. Living a life that is holy, that is set apart to God. And um, way back in the Old Testament, the first five books of the Old Testament are called the Law. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, you may also hear somebody talk about the Pentateuch. Well, the Pentateuch are the first five books of the Bible, the books of the Law. Or you may hear uh, a Jewish person talk about them as being the Torah. Um, those are the first five books of the law. And so, um, as we look at those first five books of the law, one of the things that, that God told Moses that was very important is that you should be holy as I am holy. And more times in Deuteronomy it says, I am a holy God, and I want you to be holy. That is a command that comes over and over and over. And, you know, sometimes when I hear, you should be holy as I am holy, that scares me. Even, even your pastor, that scares me when God repeated that command over and over. He really expects, us of, expects it of us. And if God expects it of us, wouldn't he give us everything that we need to accomplish that? And so, um, and sometimes, yes, sometimes we translate it as, as God says, I am perfect, so you may be perfect. And we go, uh-oh, that's trouble, because we don't like that word perfection. Matter of fact, there's a Christian song, I, I wince every time I hear it, and, and, and the line goes something like, uh, perfection is my enemy. I'm like, mm, I wince when I hear that. Because, and we hear, don't we hear it often? We say, um, Christians aren't perfect, they're only forgiven. Mm, don't we hear that? Yeah, that's, that's not really scriptural. Um, because God wants us to love as He loves. God wants us to act out to others the way that He would act out to others. God is calling us, and God is calling us on a journey to join Him in this journey of holiness. I want you to understand that we should never stop growing on this journey of holiness. There is, never, there is never a time in our Christian life where we say, well, that's good enough for government work. You guys have all heard that statement, right? That's good enough for government work, which means, well, it's not quite right, but it's good enough. That's not the way it works in the Christian life. The Christian life calls us to constantly be, be maturing in Christ. And there's never a time where we say, well, that's just good enough for government work. No, if, it, if we say it's just good enough for government work, it's time to get back on the ball and start working on it again. Listen to this thought that comes from this great hymn. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art, come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp 
thy own image deep on my heart. That's what being holiness people is all about. It's taking our own being and translating it into Christ being. Christ in me. Another great hymn that we sing at Christmas, you might not recognize the verses because it's a, it's a kind of an obscure verse that we don't sing, but listen to this. It says, Adam's likeness, Lord, a face. A face means a race. So Adam's likeness, Lord, a race. Stamp thy image in its place. Second Adam from above, that's Jesus. Reinstate us in thy love. That was written by Charles Wesley. And... That is what it is all about. That's what living this life is all about. Um, God desires us to live this kind of life. Remember what Jesus said in the Great Commission? He said, teach these new disciples to obey everything that I have taught you. And so the, one of the things that I want us to see is I want us to see that each characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit is also a characteristic that God desires in us and is a characteristic that God himself embodies. We know that God is love. We know that God is joy. We know that God is peace. And this morning we're going to discover, guess what? That God is also patience. That sounded weird, didn't it? God is also patience. It is a quality that God has. God calls us to be like him and Yet as we think about the word patience, one of the, one of the, immediately our thoughts go to this. When we think about patience, it's simply not losing our cool. Now, speaking of not losing our cool, I want you to take a look at this. Okay, we're stopping. Apparently somebody lost their cool. Apparently they didn't have patience. At least the way we normally think about patience. And then, and then also this week, I um I posted something on Facebook. So if you're thinking, well, I'm not on Facebook. I have no idea what you posted. I'm gonna let you see what I posted on Facebook and see what you think about that. patience, because patience is a wonderful thing. Hurry up, let me get it. Gotta have it now. I want it more than anything. This has taken long enough. Give me some of that patience stuff. I think that for most of us, if we thought about this idea of the fruit of the Spirit, that fan keeps blowing on me and blowing my pages away, we would define patience as this. The capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, suffering without getting angry or upset. Would most of you agree that that's, that's a pretty good view of patience, a pretty good definition of patience? Yes. But wait, there's more. And I kind of feel like I'm on an infomercial now. But wait, there's more. Now, the word patience, in most modern translations of the Bible, this word is translated patience. Um, and... One of the things I remember growing up using the King James Version, and the word that would be used in the King James Version is, there we go, long-suffering. Now, what, what fruit do you think of immediately when you think of long-suffering? Hopefully a banana, because a banana is long, long-suffering. Uh, my, my jokes are long. <laughs> but long-suffering, you know what long-suffering is? It's made up of two words in the Greek, meaning long and temper. Literally meaning long temper. We know what being short-tempered is. That's having a short fuse. Well, guess what? Being long-tempered is the exact opposite. 
But there's another word. As I was as I was looking at the various definitions and I was looking at things, and then I turned to uh, another Bible translation. I was looking through them on on Google on Bible Gateway, and this word came up: forbearance. Forbearance. Most of us are only familiar with the word for forbearance in kind of a legal uh, situation. If you if you have student loans, or if you've ever had student loans, or parent plus loans, you might know what forbearance is. Forbearance, boy, he's getting, getting, getting busy, isn't he? Yep. Forbearance is giving up your right to collect. I think we have a good idea of what patience is giving up our right to collect. And we're going to see how that works out. One of the words that comes when I think of forbearance, one of the words that comes to mind is a word like grace or mercy. Giving up our right to collect. Matter of fact, Philippians 2, chapter, uh, Philippians 2, verse 6, right, starting with verse 5, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and took the humble position of a slave. <coughs> Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he forbore his divine privileges. He took the humble position as a slave. God had patience with us. God gave up his divine right to become like one of us. And he was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. The more I looked at it, the more I studied it this week, the more... I was, determined, I was convinced in my own mind that patience isn't so much what we think of the ability to accept or tolerate delay or trouble or suffering without getting angry. But patience is forbearance. Let me share with you a story. It comes from Matthew's Gospel 18, 23-35. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who borrowed money for him. In the process, one of his servants was brought to him who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. And then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. What was that? That's forbearance. That's forbearance. The king gave up his right to collect the debt. But listen what happened. And this is like us. This is, this is like us. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few measly thousand dollars. And he grabbed him by the throat and he demanded payment instantly. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged him for a little bit more time. Please be patient with me. Please forbear me and I will pay it. But his creditor wouldn't wait and he had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt was paid in full. Ouch. Do we do that? Have we been, have, has God not forbear? Has God not been patient with us and we can't be patient with our fellow human beings? How many of you ladies wore open-toed shoes this morning? I know I should have bought my steel tips this morning because this, when I, as I was putting this together, I'm like, man, this is, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. Then when some of the other servants saw this, they were upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. 
And then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. You asked me for forbearance. Should you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had been paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forbear. I'm changing the words a little bit there. It says, if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. You know what? The King of kings and the Lord of lords has forbore our sins. Sometimes we, we look at other people and we say, I can't do that. But God has called us to do that. He has called us to forbear each other. Not just the brothers and sisters who are sitting in this room. And I know when somebody cuts you off, like somebody cut that motorcycle off, and then the guy kicked him in the door, it gets really hard to forbear another sin. That's what God has called us to do. That through the Holy Spirit, that is what God is calling us to do. As I said at the beginning, each one of these characteristics is a characteristic that God Himself has. The Old Testament is full of stories about how God was patient with the Israelites. Matter of fact, a couple times, humans had to intervene and said, God, you said you're a patient God. Won't you be patient with us just a little bit more? Because maybe the other nations will see that you really are a forbearing God. Wow. Even places there, it says, must you test the Lord's patience? And so this morning I want to share with you a couple other places where this idea of patience and forbearance, you'll notice that I'm kind of using the words interchangeably because they fit so well together. 1 Timothy 1.16, Paul is writing to young Timothy, his protege. He says, But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinner. His great patience, his great forbearance. God is patient with us. He does not deal with us the way we deserve. The Apostle Peter writes, and remember our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. God does not desire that any should perish, but He is patient so that we can come to Him. Forbearance. Listen. Again, Paul now writes, don't you see how wonderfully kind tolerant and forbearing God is with you? Does this not mean anything to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sins? It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Wow. Just imagine if God would deal with us the way we want to deal with people who don't know Jesus. I don't think anybody would to come to Jesus. Paul writes again, in the same way, speaking of this anger uh, that we sometimes show towards others, in the same way, even though God has the right to show His anger and power, uh-oh, here comes that forbearance again, in the same way, even though God has the right to show His anger and power, He is very patient with those on whom His anger falls, those who are destined for destruction. And then here's Peter. I already kind of alluded to this. The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise, about coming back, because people were like, Peter, when's Jesus coming back? When's Jesus coming back? Isn't, isn't, isn't it wrong that Jesus hasn't come back yet? Peter says, no, he is being patient. He is being forbearing. He is giving up his right to collect for your sake, for your sake. 
He does not want anyone to be destroyed. Is it hard to imagine? So many times when we think of God, and this is what the Israelites thought of God, they thought of this God who was ready to, to go, like, the, like the God, the Greek God Zeus. They were ready to take his lightning bolt to go, Psh! the moment we mess up, God's ready to go, Psh! God's not like that. Lord have mercy. The Lord has had mercy on us. And, and, the, and, 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 and that, that phrase that I just used, I know so many times we hear that phrase used in such a glib and casual way. But that should be the prayer of our heart every day. Lord have mercy on my soul. Thank you for being patient. Thank you for being forbearing. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. The Latin says, Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Lord have mercy. In some more traditional liturgical churches, they sing that, they sing a phrase like that almost every week. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. When we have a cross word for somebody who cuts us off, and I'll tell you what, the Lord has been reminding me that every time I'm driving. He says, you don't know what that person's going through. You're right, God. I don't know what that person's going through. I don't know what that person's thinking of. That person may have just lost a loved one, and they don't know what they're doing. They're, 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 they're out of their head right now. We don't know other people's stories. And so God has been reminding me every time that I want to have a crossword with somebody who cuts me off. He said, will you pray for them instead? Will you have mercy on them instead? So God has been teaching you this week. God has been teaching you. Lord, have mercy. And by you having, by me having mercy, God was mercy on me merciful on myself, so I want to be merciful to others. Remember these words that we used? Coming up on screen. Patience, long-suffering, forbearing. These are the characteristics that God shows to us because of what? Because of His great love toward us. Because of His great mercy. Because of His grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a what? A wretch. Now, Pastor, I'm not a wretch. Well, without Christ, we are all wretches. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. We don't deserve one thing that God has given us. It is simply through His mercy. It is through His grace. He is patient. He is forbearing. When I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how he raised me, how he picked me up from sob. Oh, how he healed me. How he healed me. The very most how he saved me to the uttermost. When I think about all those things, it makes me want to shout. Hallelujah. God has not God, God has not dealt with us the way we, we do. And, and, and I don't want to minimize the sin. I don't want to minimize God's great love for us over the sin because God calls us, those who are sinners need to repent of their sins and come to Him. But God has great love for us. We are His children. I love this definition. Being merciful means showing compassion to another one. 
especially if that person has offended you. Being merciful means showing to compassion to another one, especially if that person has offended you. Or how about this? Being merciful means showing compassion to another one if they are under your authority. In another part of the scriptures, it tells us that Jesus Christ has all authority over everything on earth, including us. Jesus was merciful to us and showed us the way. He was forbearing. He was patient with us. Some of you are probably thinking, okay, Pastor Bill, you're drawing this out. I don't... I'm not doing it on purpose, but I just feel like sometimes I don't get it. Sometimes we don't get it. We don't get it. That God is so forbearing to us. God is so merciful to us that we should have, most of us should have died a long time ago for our sins. But God in His great mercy came to us when we were still sinners. And he died for us so that we would be friends of God. Wow. 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 If God can be compassionate toward us, shouldn't we as his children be compassionate towards others? I don't remember where this last scripture comes. I'm hoping it's on the screen. Uh, First Peter. Or Second Peter, listen to this. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence, and moral excellence with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like I said, God has been working on me on this message all week and helping me to be less judgmental, to be more forbearing, to be more patient. So God has been working on me, and, and like I wrote on that one post this week, Lord, have mercy. God, if, if, if you had mercy on me, help me be merciful to others.